Is ESP real? ESP very simply is the ability to glean information outside of the ordinary senses. I think all of us have had experiences of the extraordinary. Time is illusory. We think we live in this very orderly linear world, but it isn't real. It's a necessary illusion. We know that linear time as we experience it is not absolute, it's conditional. So why then couldn't a person glean information from what we call the future? The dimensions of the psyche are vast, fuller and more mysterious than anything we've ever known. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered if extrasensory perception, ESP, is real, and if so, what it means for you, then do we have the Cosmic Habit Force show for you. Today I'll be speaking with Mitch Horowitz, award-winning pen historian, seeker, and the best-selling author of many of my favorite books, including a brilliant new work, Cosmic Habit Force. Today I want to venture into the unknown and the known in the realm of ESP and science and what's real, where's the proof, and what it means for you. So welcome back to the show, Mitch. Are you ready to shine? Yes, sir. Good to be here. Well, glad to have you here and a mighty woohoo! So I've got to ask, I've got to lead the witness it's been interesting setting things up. I always wonder what the universe has to do with things. But Mitch, is ESP real? Oh, it's unquestionably real. And I, I say that as a person who always tries to take care to question my own beliefs. Because if we don't question our own beliefs, what do we become? We just become catechists or polemicists or people who are just peddling some political speech or something of that nature. We have laboratory-based evidence for the anomalous transfer of information between people or the ability of individuals to gain coordinates or to remote view that has been with us and has been replicated and validated now for generations. I would say, frankly, Michael, that the ESP question, as it's figured into academic psychical research, is settled going back to the 1940s. It's just that our culture is so disputatious about it that it's remained a live debate. Now, for some people, including members of the Inspire Nation family, ESP research as a clinical discipline might be of secondary importance because people feel, look, I know and I have lived out experiences in my own life that are confirmatory enough. And I respect that 100%. But at heart, uh, I'm a rationalist. It's both a strength and a weakness. So I tend towards research. And the research is just absolutely rock solid and repeated. So I want to go there today. I want to go to some of the highlights. I know you have at least three very key highlights. And I want to throw in a fourth, which is 9-11 here and random number generators. But first off, how do we define ESP? And then let's look at the world of ESP research going back to J.B. Ryan. ESP, of course, stands for extrasensory perception, a term that J.B. Ryan, the great ESP researcher at Duke University in the 1930s, helped to popularize and make into a household term. ESP, very simply, is the ability to glean information outside of the ordinary senses. So, meaning going supra beyond the five senses, taking in information. For instance, Jessica went to make a phone call earlier today to her doctor to make an appointment. She picks up the phone before she could dial. There was the uh, doctor's office on the phone calling her. Wait a second. Who thought of the call first? Yes, and people have those experiences all the time. I I'm astounded that when I speak about ESP research, in front of audiences or with people who might be considered hardcore materialists, I will always encounter individuals, very often in private, who approach me afterwards telling me, look, I'm not so sure about the whole ESP thing, but I want to tell you about this precognitive dream I had or something. And they'll report something more astonishing than anything I've said from the podium. I think all of us have had experiences of the extraordinary. And of course, critics will try to explain away these experiences through what might be called the law of large numbers. And the law of large numbers dictates that because ours is a very, very large population, we live 
in a largely densely populated planet, striking things have to happen to somebody. And there's legitimacy to that up to a certain point. The point past which that explanation becomes legitimate is the emotions and the individual meaning attached to the experience, which are very, very difficult to measure. So for example, if you were walking down abandoned uh, beach somewhere in the tropics and you ran into an old friend from junior high school, you might say to yourself, well, that's astounding. Yeah, it is. It becomes more astounding if you were just thinking about the friend. It becomes more astounding if you had some unfinished business emotionally with that friend, whatever it was, and you were just thinking how great it would be to settle that unfinished emotional business, and maybe he or she was thinking the same thing, and et cetera, et cetera. And as you start to get to that peak of rarity in terms of the individual meaning of the event, it's no longer measurable. It's off the charts. There's, there's something synchronous about it. Like thinking about an ex-girlfriend and running into her of all places in the world in the Paris metro on a subway. How in the world does it happen? So I want to go to some of the research. We don't have to dive in too, too deep, but it's important for people to understand because if you go online and you even talk online about being tricked by it, you go online, you go to your favorite site, you go to Wiki, (laughs) put favorite maybe in quotes, and it's going to say there ain't no proof. That's their technical term for it. So if we go to J.B. Ryan, what did he research? What did he find? Why is he your hero? Well, you've raised a lot of good points. J.B. Ryan was a pioneering ESP researcher, and he really is my intellectual hero. He started the parapsychology lab at Duke University in the early 1930s. And J.B.'s wish was to create a really simple, repeatable set of protocols that could be used to test for ESP or the ability to glean information outside the senses. So J.B., along with his colleagues, set up a series of card tests called Zener card tests. Zener cards are very recognizable. You've seen them in Ghostbusters. You've probably seen them other places. They're a five-suit deck of cards that have very simple images on them, square, circle, star, squiggly lines. And basically, you've got a 1 in 5% or 20% chance of getting a correct guess on a shuffled deck of Zener cards. What JB found is that there were certain subjects across tens of thousands of trials who again and again would score higher than 20%. It might be 26%, 27%, 28%, in certain cases even higher still. And if you average that out, Michael, over literally tens of thousands of trials, you are finding a violation of what eventually becomes a law of averages over very large numbers. And it doesn't go away, and it's repeatable. And what you're learning is that certain individuals, JB thought it was about one in five of us, are capable of gleaning information in ways that go outside of our ordinary senses or technologies. So now this is thousands of thousands of studies going back to the 1930s. Maybe we should go from there to Charles Honerton and the Gansfeld experiments. This was a trip. Uh, Charles Onerton, another great, great ESP researcher who sadly died at a very, very young age. He died at the age of 46 in 1992. And Onerton asked the question of whether ESP was perhaps more general to the population. And maybe there were certain conditions, certain physical conditions under which the ESP effect could be spiked. So Onerton, who was a brilliant mind, came up with a series of experiments called the Gansfeld experiments. Gansfeld is German for open field. And what Onerton found is that if you place the individual in conditions of comfortable sensory deprivation, you might seat somebody in a Depro tank with dimmed lighting, headphones on that are emitting white noise, eye shades, put them in a lazy boy recliner, something like that and you put the individual into a very, very relaxed, comfortable state of sensory deprivation, you seem to get a spike and it seems to occur more generally throughout the population. So he might seat somebody inside a Depro tank. He specifically was testing for telepathy or mind-to-mind communication. Seat somebody else outside the tank who attempts to convey images of the person in the tank. And Onerton found percentages that were similar to JB's, but in in some cases uh, a a good deal higher. And so it suggests that a state of comfortable meditation or sensory deprivation is a condition under which ESP starts to appear 
more generally throughout the population. It sounds like either a flow state or quite literally we go into the shower and we have that eureka moment where things pop into our head because we're not busy thinking. And you and I both admire the French mind theorist Emile Coué. You have your mug that says day by day in every way I'm getting better and better. I, I have it on a ring. I don't know if the viewers could see it. But uh, Coué uh, uh, devised that mantra specifically to be used in a state that we today call hypnagogia. It's the very, very relaxed state that you experience twice a day just as you're drifting to sleep at night and just as you're coming to in the morning. So dig this. You don't need a Depro tank. You don't need to be rushing into the shower. Every day, twice a day, all of us experience this state of hypnagogia just as we're drifting to sleep and just as we're coming to. It's a very relaxed, supple state. It seems to be prime time for ESP-related activity. Now, this sounds also, and you talk a lot about habit in your most recent book, this sounds like something that is both repeatable and promotable. You can get better at this the more that you practice. What do you feel? I, personally speaking, never allow a 24 period to pass without using that hypnagogic state, that very relaxed state, without reciting a prayer, uh, reciting a mantra, or trying to glean some sort of insight. And it's, it's very useful because again, we all experience it twice a day during the sleep cycles. And when you're in that state of hypnagogia, that super relaxed state, you might experience hallucinations, you might experience very heavy limbs, you might even experience a kind of sleep paralysis, but you still have control over your cognition. And you can use that cognitive control, as I was saying, to say a prayer, use a uh, visualization, recite an affirmation. It's a very, very suggestible, supple period of time, cognitively speaking. It also, again, seems to be prime time for ESP. So my message to people is use it, use it, it's, it's effortless. Thank you. So going a little bit more into the science, and we can play with some of the how to stuff. There was a signature event with Ray Hyman. What was that event? What took place? And what are the numbers we're talking about? Ray Hyman is a research psychologist at the University of Oregon, still living. He is a hardcore professional skeptic, a lifelong skeptic of anything related to the paranormal and ESP. However, in 1986, several years before Onerton's death, a signature moment in ESP research occurred. He and Charles Onerton collaborated on a paper where they affirmed that the data that Onerton was discovering in the Gonsfeld experiments and the data of other experimenters, which they crushed together in a meta-analysis, was unpolluted, was uncorrupted, was legit. Hyman, the skeptic, said, I do not believe in the ESP thesis, but I do believe that we are seeing a legitimate statistical anomaly according to recognized clinical methods, which are unpolluted by fraud, mistakes, or laboratory errors. And so it was just extraordinary because you had a skeptic for the first time, and I would also say for the last time, saying, look, I don't agree with what's going on, but I agree that the data is real, the data is sound. You know what's interesting? Where the mind is trained to go is a really, it's a slippery slope. I hear you discussing the data. I hear you discussing some brilliant minds, and brilliant minds on both sides of the fence is a strange term because we're all on the same fence. But with that said, the mind is saying, that's so long ago. Is that science really real? We're talking about, you know, 40 years ago. We're talking about 90 years ago. Is it legit? That's a very good question. In a certain sense, methods improve over time. Sometimes we look back upon experiments from a generation ago or even from 10 years ago, and we see there were wrinkles or problems in the methods and say, mm, well, there's a better way to do it. So, in fact, this research has continued. There's a researcher named Daryl Bem at Cornell University, who 
I'm going to say as recently as 2011, but it's more recent than that because people have been replicating his experiments. He conducted experiments quite recently into precognition in which events in the so-called future affect what happens to us right now. He used uh, word test exercises to test for whether studying a list of words in the future would improve your memorization right now. It was just an incredibly well-designed experiment. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because that one is so trippy and cool. It's really cool to me, Mitch. It's very far out. Let's say I give you a list of words to memorize, perfectly ordinary cognitive experiment, and we see how you do. Well, you get such and such a score. Then we rerun the test, same deal, same everything, but we have you memorize the same list of words uh, shortly off into the future. So we're testing you, Michael, right now. Let's say it's 3 p.m. Eastern time on a Thursday. Let's see how you do on the test. Well, so I don't even, I haven't gotten, gotten the list yet. I'm going to give the names, but I haven't even seen the list. Well, you, you've seen the list, but we just do it in a very ordinary way. You know, I give you 10 words, <clears throat> you make the effort to memorize them. Let's say you get five out of 10 correct, you know, very normal result. But let's say we add a wrinkle to the experiment where several minutes later, we're going to have you work on memorizing those words again. You do better, even though you haven't memorized the words yet. Do you dig? You're going to memorize the words shortly off into the future, but in the present of the experiment, you do better when we add in that wrinkle. So it's retrocausality. It's retrocausality. That's what them found. And of course, the critics had a field day over this and said, this is embarrassing. This is ridiculous. These results never should have been published in a mainstream journal. His reputation was dragged through the mud. There were negative articles about him. Well, dig this, dig this. The main criticism that critics uh, voice of ESP experiments is they can't be repeated. And if you can't repeat it, it ain't science because the scientific, I mean, what is science? It's methodological replicability. What else is it? That's what it is. Everybody runs around invoking the term science as if it's Moses bringing the tablets down from Mount Sinai. Well, it's a question. Why, why did science become God? And we'll get, we'll get there in a minute, but that's an important question. And Bem's experiments were rerun dozens and dozens of times. In fact, he opened up the books. He provided his software for free. He provided an instruction manual for free. He exercised total transparency so that anybody any researcher who wanted to rerun his experiments uh, was, was basically given an open book, an instruction manual, and free software to do so if they felt like it. Well, his experiments were rerun and statistically validated in a meta-analysis 90 times in 33 different labs in 14 different nations. And they were meta-analyzed and found statistically significant, and this is as recent as his paper was most recently updated in July of 2020, July of 2020. So we have recent up to the minute evidence that has been vastly and widely repeated and shown to be valid in meta-analysis. What does it tell you about the world that we can know something before it's known? This is the heavy question. What it suggests, and this goes into, this, this starts to interlace with quantum theory, this starts to interlace with string theory, this starts to interlace with interpretations of quantum data and mystical experience, of course. It tells us that time is illusory. Linear time is illusory. We think we live in this very orderly linear world, and to some extent, that kind of thinking is necessary. We couldn't get through life without it. If you say to me, hey, Mitch, we're going to do an interview at noon Eastern time. Well, I have to show up. I can't tell you, gee, Michael, there's no such thing as time. So I'll be there whenever. Of course, we five sensory beings need linear time to navigate our way through life. But it isn't real. It's a necessary illusion. And dig this. We as a civilization, we as a human community, we know this because this goes back to Einstein's theories of time and relativity extending back to the early 20th century. Einstein made the case, which has since been proven, 
that a person moving at light speed or near light speed in a proverbial spaceship experiences time differently than does an observer. Time slows down for that individual. He or she ages more slowly. Time also slows down in environments of extreme gravity, like a black hole. And these are not just thought exercises. These are hardcore fact. Dig, here in our own era right now, astronauts who are moving obviously nowhere near the velocity of light speed, astronauts experience minutely effects of reduced aging. These are absolute facts. I read about this in a forthcoming book called Daydream Believer. So we know, we know that linear time as we experience it is not absolute, it's conditional. It's not the real deal, it's not really what's going on. So my contention is, hey, is it really so far out that we discover something that we call precognition? Precognition sounds very far out, Daryl Bem's experiments sound very far out, but we as a human community have known for decades that time is conditional, it's not absolute. So why then couldn't a person glean information from what we call the future? The future ain't what we think it is because we know that time changes based upon conditions. Thank you. And I, I want to get in in a little bit. I want to dive into some how-to stuff of how we can play with this. But really what we're doing, it seems to me, is we're, we're peeling back the fabric of space and time, understanding that we are not tied to the world the way we thought we are. And maybe we thought we were for our spiritual evolution, and that is beginning to change as we wake up. But what it also means, if we're not tied to time, we're also not tied to a particular reality, are we? Exactly, exactly. And there's an interpretation of quantum mechanics called the many worlds theory. And the many worlds theory dictates that within quantum mechanics, we witness particles everywhere at once until someone takes a measurement. Those particles exist only in potential until a measurement is taken. And when a measurement is taken, they get localized to just one place. Well, my contention is, what are our five senses but instruments of measurement? What else are they? We smell, we touch, we see, we hear, we taste. We measure the world, and this is very useful and necessary. Is food fresh? Is food rancid? How far away is something? How close can I go to the edge of this cliff? What have you. These are measurements. So if it's a fact that measurement determines locality in the particle lab, now, Admittedly, you can't just easily translate that information from the particle level to the macro level that we live in. There are different intervening conditions, but nonetheless, a law in order to be a law must be consistent. So there's got to be some degree to which measurement, sensory measurement in our world is determinative of event. That's my contention, at least. Brilliant. And, and I want to I do some fun extrapolation here. You said that there are intervening conditions, why quanta effects have an effect at this level, unless maybe, I'm contending, that if we step back the aperture far enough, it actually does. If we each are a, a, a cell in the being of humanity, and there is one human beingness, for instance, then the actions that we take, for instance, a war taking place on the other side of the planet, or a large weather event, we can, based on all of our intention and focus together, affect the outcomes. It's entirely possible. One of the conditions that might get in the way is that, as I was alluding earlier, we human beings seem to be built for singular outcomes. We have to pay attention to time. We have to pay attention to the fact that there's one chair here that I'm sitting on. It doesn't matter if we really live in a quantum universe. I need to know where to sit down. We're limited. But there may be certain moments, either collectively, as you were suggesting, or in the life of the individual, maybe in moments of extreme relaxation, maybe in moments of that we would describe as mystical experience where everything suddenly seems to stand still and we no longer feel so singular. Maybe we feel a sense of connection to other beings. There's all kinds of variations of what we call mystical experience. Maybe in such moments, we get to step outside of that mode and we suddenly discover that our psyches are ineffable, that our psyches are infinite, that our psyches can select perhaps 
different dimensions or perspectives of reality from which we live. Well, now what you're starting to describe is you're talking about what I'm going to call dream space time. We can learn and train ourselves on the dream playing field to work with time differently, to instantly be someplace else. And if you go, well, I can't do that. We've all experienced a dream where time was jumbled or one moment you're in Paris, the next second you're in New York and you don't even know which took place first. It's interesting. Just the other night I had a dream where in the dream I was describing to another individual something else that had occurred in the dream. And I thought to myself, is that really what was happening? Did that other thing that I'm describing really occur five minutes ago in the dream? Or did it just seem to occur because it was so persuasive to me, the dreamlike being? So we start to get into states, dreams are one of them, where we may be able to play with time. And it comes and goes. I mean, we still have to function under the rules of the road here in the macro world that we live in. But there are moments of extreme awareness. And my contention is those moments of extreme awareness, or what might be called mystical experiences, they're not imaginary. They might be realer than what we're experiencing right now. And they might be that we can actually pull them back or pull back that understanding. And, and I love your current book. We can pull back that understanding so that we can be, I'm going to use the term magicians. We can use the term mystics as well. We have a school of mystics here, so we can use that term. But we are better able to master this world when we start to understand that the rules that appear to be real here aren't all there is. They aren't all there is. And one of the things that I'm trying to probe personally in my search right now is whether understanding this, understanding what you just described, if one hears that, if one grokks to that, if one starts to think, you know what, this is making sense to me, I'm getting this, do we then begin to approach a point where technique and method is no longer necessary? The very realization of your psyche as a tool of infinitude, does that mean that the wish itself is sufficient. The wish itself is enough. I love the visualizations. I love the mantras. I love the writing techniques. I use them all the time and they're necessary. But it's possible that within our generation as we're coming more and more to understand the infinitude of the psyche, it's possible that we may be approaching a threshold where the wish itself is sufficient. We don't need the technique. We don't need the method. That's something I'm working with. Well, that's probably what part of your mission is. That's what my mission is. I was writing more about my mission statement with my school of mystics. Why I'm teaching what I'm teaching here is consciousness is rising as far as I can tell. It's always spiraling upwards. We are awakening continuously to a higher level. It may not even feel that way in the moment, but we are continuously, like an electron, going from one state change to the next to the next. So why is it that we would need to stay at one level where everything is as it is when there is another game that can be played? I'm convinced my daughter coming in somewhere in the next month, month and a half, and I'm looking at the clock and it's saying one, 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 and I'm going, thank you, universe. I get it. She will be able to do stuff I couldn't even imagine. Just as Roger Bannister, four-minute mile. When he broke that mile, everybody had been meticulous and trained so hard and nobody could do it. And now you can almost have a high school kid, a damn good one, break the four-minute mile because something has shifted in our awareness. One of the mysteries of human performance, something that you've worked with a lot as an athlete, is that once somebody breaks that barrier, once somebody breaks a record, what happens? Not only do more and more people start doing it, but new records get set and they're continuously set and the bar keeps going higher and higher. And it's a mystery of human nature. Once we do the so-called impossible, then suddenly that just becomes history and everybody's coming along and surpassing it. So presumably we're experiencing something similar with regards to the psyche. Thank you. So I want to go into some more of the how to see stuff. And, and I was talking with Jessica about this. She came up with some really interesting questions. But before that, can we go to the random number generator and 9-11? Random number generators are machines that spit out completely random series of numbers. They're used to set uh, internet passwords, for example. So there's a collection of researchers at Princeton University. I was just meeting with some of these guys 
uh, in the month of January, actually. There's a, a collection of researchers at Princeton at the uh, what is now a retired paranormal research lab called the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab. But their work has continued under something called the Global Consciousness Project. What these researchers have done is placed random number generator machines at locations throughout the globe. And what the, the researchers have found is that when there are events that are of peak emotional intensity, 9-11 being a prime example, we witness interruptions in the chaos, interruptions in the randomness of data being spit out by these random number generators. There ought to be no pattern at all. It's total static, but suddenly a signal appears in the noise. And this occurs at moments of peak emotional intensity. Doesn't necessarily have to be a tragedy like 9-11, although that's certainly the prime example. But we've seen this occur in the Global Consciousness Project research during elections uh, that are highly pitched, like the election of Barack Obama or the election of Donald Trump. Whenever there's sort of a period of emotional intensity that seems to be felt worldwide in one way or another, we see effects within the random number generator data that show patterns, and there ought to be no patterns. So it raises the question of a kind of worldwide psychokinetic effect, a worldwide global consciousness. Thank you. I don't want to go too much into the specific event. We are probably, unless you're living in a cave at this point, heard of what happened at the Oscars. And where I am going with that, and I just send love to everybody. That's my whole MO. I'm going to send love to everybody everywhere, period. However, it seems to me that there can be a resonance in the field on one part of the planet where there is warring and fighting and scary stuff going down. And that can affect everyone on an individual basis all the way on the other side, that we are not immune to this sea of information that you're talking about that we're now swimming in. It's interesting, Michael. Uh, you're raising heavy questions about human nature and about what we wish to experience, what we wish for ourselves, what we wish for others. I've been asked a question quite recently. It's a very natural question. If we as a human community have these psychical abilities, if I can put it that way, then why is there an outbreak of war in Ukraine? Why is there, why are there all these tragic events? First of all, it's a great mystery, but, and we can point to all kinds of geopolitical reasons, but obviously we're talking on a different scale. Look, human nature is very multifaceted. Human nature, unfortunately, can be very violent. I mean, look at our entertainment. The most popular media in the world today is video games. And, you know, the video games themselves are mostly war games. Those are just the facts. Look at what we do in terms of entertainment. And I'm just like everybody else. We're interested in UFC or mixed martial arts. I take my kids to the matches. We're interested in rock'em sock'em movies. We're interested in violent video games. It's a reflection of who we are as a human species, and none of us are immune to it. So when people say, if there are these infinite dimensions to the mind, then why is there all this suffering in the world? I can only look back to myself as an individual. You know, the other night, I was driving back from Canada. I was fatigued. I was exhausted. I, was, uh, I stopped in a small town in upstate New York to stay at a hotel and to get a bite to eat. There was a McDonald's there. The McDonald's was closed earlier than their posted hours. And uh, uh, to be frank, I lost my shit. I got very angry. I apologized to the McDonald's workers in the town of Hancock, New York. My, my heartfelt apologies, you know. Mitch, I've been there with a Taco Bell. It was a long time ago, but I was there and I lost it at the counter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> neither of us can return to Hancock, New York. Um, so... <laughs> Very nice people there, and I apologize. And But the, the fact is, I was fatigued. I was tired. I acted out, you know. And, and, and here I am. I'm dedicating my whole life to the search, and I just, I just lost it. No one's life is exceptional. We all have universal experiences. That's one of the gifts of human nature, it seems to me. We can all relate to one another. So why is my life any different from anybody else's life? We're all doing this all the time. That, that's part of human nature. So I don't think that 
increases in psychical awareness necessarily. I'd like to say that it would result in a better world, but I think that the jury is way out on that. I don't see evidence of that because we're complex beings and we have emotions and those emotions get out of control. So fortunately for everyone, I don't need to base things fully on evidence. <laughs> here's, here's where I'm going to go. And on a show on, on science and ESP, here's where I'm going to go. That there will come a point, and I'm going to go to um, Stephen Greer, who we've had on the show, a UFOologist, and we'll go to UFOs. We might as well in a minute. He says that, uh, uh, of course, they're they're higher dimensional beings, and I want to discuss that with you and the science behind it. That on this scale of higher dimensional beings, we are at a level zero right now. We are living with this animalist nature that we have not risen above, but there will come a tipping point. And this gets to global coherence, for instance. There may come a tipping point where that um, level of energy no longer exists in the field. And when our blood sugar goes down, we have a very different outcome based on the field of everything that is around us. It's very possible. Uh, I I, want to believe that. I certainly want to believe that. Once I was at a workshop with the philosopher Jacob Needleman, who's been an influence on me. And one of the participants said to him, hey, isn't everything that we, that we really need already inside us? And he paused and he said, well, there's a lot more inside us than just that. There's a lot of warring emotions inside us. There's a lot of hunger inside us. And you're right, you know, to use the analogy of blood sugar, it begs questions about human nature. I mean, look, there are yogis in the Veda culture who are very, very highly developed in terms of psychical abilities. They're very highly developed in terms of controlling and regulating their bodies. I don't know that such individuals are necessarily more ethically developed than anybody walking the street. And in fact, We certainly know of episodes, all of us know of episodes in which gifted yogic figures have displayed very poor ethics, very poor concern for what happens to their disciples or for other people. There are cases of abuse, obviously, and and these things are not just happenstance. It leads us to the question of whether psychical ability works in tandem with ethical insight. I personally have not witnessed that. So I have very deep questions about human nature. Let's go one last interesting tidbit here, and then let's do some how toozy before we wrap this up. UFO, or I think they're calling them some, they've given another word for them. I still say UFO. (laughs) There will always be a planet. UFOs will always be UFOs in my house, you know, so. We were taught growing up, um, well, that was certainly the kiss of death of your credibility of anything to say, I believe in UFOs. What's going on now? Why do you believe we're getting more information? Well, it's a fascinating time to be alive. We have more concrete evidence of UFOs at this moment in history than we ever have before. We have them on high resolution cockpit video from fighter jets. We have them on radar. We have as high a quality of visual evidence as you could possibly ask for. And of course, I take seriously the eyewitness accounts as well. Human testimony really matters. Human testimony is a record. So that's important as well. So we have this incredible evidence. And we as a human community are asking ourselves, what is this? And as you were alluding, the question of whether UFOs are a thing or not has been put to rest. Yes, they are a thing. No serious person in our culture engages in UFO denialism anymore. Nobody says, oh, you know, swamp gas, delusion, imagination, little green men, and so forth. The UFO question is almost universally acknowledged. So now we face the question as a generation, well, what are they? I would contend that it's easier, that it's actually easier to explain the UFO thesis according to interdimensionality than it is by extraterrestriality, because the distances are so vast, and there is very serious question, and Einstein contended, that we can't travel faster than light speed. So how would crafts get around in such a way as to visit us? We have models of reality like cosmic wormholes. 
which would allow a craft to go incredible distances without surpassing light speeds. So there's that. But the models of interdimensionality that we have today, which are supported by quantum theory, some of which we were talking about earlier, it's actually easier, according to current physical models, and these are just models, to explain UFOs as interdimensional phenomena than extraterrestrial phenomena. So that's something that I'm thinking and writing about a little too. Thank you. And, and that begets the question. If we're talking about interdimensionality between dimensions, yeah, are there an infinitude of dimensions? And can we, through our own personal work, in a sense, shift to a different reality? I believe the answer to that is yes. And I work with that thesis in a, a forthcoming book called Daydream Believer, which is out in July. I ask the question of whether the individual, through a shift of perspective or through re-envisioning the past, for example, uh, the great uh, mystic teacher Neville Goddard would talk about a practice called the pruning shears of revision, where Neville maintained by going into a meditative state and reimagining a past event, you could literally and truly alter that past event. And I've, I've worked with that, and I write about this in um, Daydream Believer in a chapter called Time Travel. I've healed a bone that way, and, and it absolutely blew my mind. How have you played with this? I have played with this in the following way, and I write about this in the book. Several months ago, I was giving a talk to a convention of New Thought ministers in the Midwest. And after I delivered the talk, I rewatched the video, and I thought I did an okay job, but not a great job, and I was a little bit disappointed in myself. I went into this so-called pruning shears state where I re-delivered the talk, and I looked at the video again, and in terms of my perception, blinkered though it is, the talk was better. It was more supple. It was more coherent. It was more fast-paced. Everything about it was better. And a week later, I got flowers from the hosts of the event saying, we can't believe what a wonderful job you did. Thank you so much. And I have a picture of the flowers in Daydream Believer. Now, a person could argue, gee, it was just perception, so forth and so on. I can only report that was my experiment and that was my experience. And in having that experiment and experience, I asked myself, what's really going on? Did I perhaps shift to a different dimensional perspective? And it's Mitch viewing events, but from a different dimension. As far out as that sounds, the interdimensional thesis may actually be necessary according to our current models of reality. And so that may be what's going on when we revise an event. If there are infinite dimensions, then a shift in perspective could in effect mean time traveling or traveling interdimensionally among those different planes of reality. It does not sound far out to me at all, particularly if you followed anything online, if you haven't anyone Googled the Mandela effect, and you see all of these collective consciousness, Luke, I am your father. If you build it, he will come, where all of a sudden, that's not what it was. What in the world is going on? And my contention is we have hopped to a different groove in the record, and then there's an infinitude of grooves. And you, through, oh, wow, cosmic habit force, you found a way to jump to a different groove. I agree with that. I agree with that. And that's my outlook. We're experimenting. We're, we're trying to figure out reality. So let's all experiment with that. Excellent. So let's go from there. Let's play with your most recent book, because it does groove and riff on Napoleon Hill, but it has some very functional techniques of how, I'm going to call this reality, uh, to use a, a good British term, squidgy at best. <laughs> it is not nearly as solid as we make it out to be, but we can play with this and change our lives based on it, can't we? That's my contention and that's my experience. And that's one of the reasons why again and again, I encourage people to have a very clear, very definite aim in life, because I think that our psychical forces, and when I, when I make reference to the psyche, I'm talking about a compact of intellect and emotion. Intellect and emotion together are very, very powerful. So 
if the psyche responds to perspective, if the psyche responds to focus, it stands to reason that focus produces force. We see this in nature all the time. We can wave air currents out of the way effortlessly, but if you focus air as a vapor into a very concentrated point, it can bore through rock. It becomes incredibly powerful. Same with light photons, same with water, etc. Why would the effects of the psyche be an exception to that? So focus is so important, intention is so important. In fact, I still believe that it's the critical factor in an individual being able to alter or in some way, in some way, determine his or her existence and experiences. A chief aim is so vital. I can't say that often enough. Going back to time travel. Can't believe I'm going to bring chief aim and time travel together. What I'm hearing is because many people who go down this rabbit hole feel a little untethered, to be honest. We've met them. I love you if you're in the audience and you're feeling a little bit lost as well. I get it. I've been there. And so we may be saying, I don't know what my chief aim is. I don't know where to place my focus. And I would contend one of the things we can do is go to your future self and ask your future self who's already seen one reality, where do I place my focus? Wow, that's a wonderful, wonderful exercise. Wonderful exercise. I actually engage in something similar to that, but it has to do with going to one's younger self. Um, I often encourage people to dial back to the fantasies, the dreams, the wishes that they can recall from the very earliest age, maybe age three, age four. And to my mind, that's very valuable because at so young an age, we haven't yet been calcified by peer pressure. I think peer pressure really gets its claws in us probably by about age nine. And we start to repeat things, including just very privately within our own psyches, that we think of as being our own independent thought, but that is heavily conditioned, I believe, by peer pressure and by what we think is going to make us look good to other people, by what we think is going to get us rewards from other people, even though these are our private thoughts. But it seems to me that when we're at that very tender age where we first start to form cognitive, recallable, long-term memories, age three or four, we obviously have infantile memories, but those are not so easy to recall. But when we start remembering our dreams, both our waking dreams and our nighttime dreams from age three, four, I think we're getting a glimpse of our true psyches. And it's very valuable to ask, what did you want at age three or four? And I bet there's a more vivid answer than we've been taught to expect. Not only that, and this is brilliant, what you're saying is brilliant here, but at age three or four, there is that still that pull, that connection, I'll call it between us and universe, look into a baby's eyes, as I'll get to do here in, in a month, month and a half time, and you're seeing through to, we can call it the other side of the veil, we can call it what we wanted, it is not corrupted yet, there is not that opacity yet. The heartstrings that are on a young child are filled with such emotion and devotion to, I want to do this, that if we harness that energy, talking about cosmic habit force, if we harness that energy of that emotion that we had in a child for whatever it is we wanted, now we can move mountains. Yes, I believe that's true. I believe that's true. And the task that the seeker faces is to get in touch with that, is to allow him or herself in private, because I believe in doing a lot of exercises in private, a completely unembarrassed, completely candid, nakedly honest acknowledgement of what was desired at that tender age and what is desired right now. And you don't have to reprocess it through so-called spiritual language. You don't have to worry about what kind of person it makes you seem like. You don't have to worry about what your shrink or your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend or your neighbor thinks of it. You just go there and it's private. It's yours. You don't have to share it with anybody. In fact, I personally encourage not doing so because other people can really take these energies from us. And that, well, that's what peer pressure is, I suppose. If you allow yourself this very night, 
the time, the space to go to a place where you experience those wishes, those desires with a complete lack of embarrassment and total self-honesty, you will probably be surprised. Well, let's take your life, for example. How much did it change when you were completely honest with yourself about how much you liked being out there and liked being in the spotlight and liked being on a, up on a podium, for instance? It's a simple truth. And I share that part of my search with people, even though I encourage people to maintain privacy. I'm not private because I feel that I owe it to the reader. I owe it to the listener to provide exposing examples. And so I try to be very exposing in my books. I dreamt of that public presence, as you were describing it, when I was three or four years old. And when I came to acknowledge that, it changed everything. It took a few years, as one of my favorite lines from the movie Stalker goes, wishes don't come true right away. Although sometimes they do, I would add, sometimes they do. I wouldn't make that into a law. But when I got in touch with that, I saw changes occur over the course of my life in about five years that have continued to unfold, continue to build, continue to develop, that brought me into sync uh, with what I wished for. But the acknowledgement had to be there first. Thank you. There's something inside of me that's saying getting in sync with our future selves. In a sense, this is, I like to talk about past, future, present. I don't say past, present, future. I say past, future, present, which encompasses that time is not real. And if we're getting in touch with the us who was and the us who will be in the middle is where anything is possible. And I want to go there to, to one more, um, I'll call this freedom technique having to do with the energies we're playing with today. I want to talk about what is a positive mental attitude, PMA, and of course, what does bad brains and HR have to do with anything? <laughs> bad brains is a punk band that I write about in Cosmic Habit Force, and HR is their lead singer. HR stands for human rights. And bad brains uh, sings about uh, talks about the importance of a positive mental attitude. I, I have their insignia PMA with a, a lightning bolt tattooed on my left bicep. And I write about the nature of a true positive mental attitude in Cosmic Habit Force. And to my mind, it is not just having a rosy outlook on life. That has almost nothing to do with it. It's evaluating circumstances based on their potential for development. That doesn't mean celebrating when something tragic happens. That doesn't mean ex not experiencing the full gamut of emotions. That doesn't mean greeting setbacks with a smile. Although I would say for those among us who have the gift of greeting setbacks with a smile, I celebrate them. I celebrate them. I'm not able to do that. If another individual is able to do that, then they have a tremendous gift and talent and I can learn from them. But real PMA, real positive mental attitude, in my estimation, and this is how bad brains meant it, and bad brains have been a big influence on me. And bad brains really means good brains. Exactly. <laughs> bad was used as street slang for good. This was their, uh, their first album released exclusively on cassette in 1981. They just reissued it. Just happens to be here, Michael. Another, another synchronicity. Always happens on Inspire Nation. So... My outlook is that positive mental attitude is evaluating events based on their potential for your development and nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Yes, we all have work a day things that we have to get through. We have obligations that we have to meet. Absolutely. But what matters and what requires your attention, your commitment, your dedication are those events and activities that are rife with potential for building your development. That's a positive attitude towards life. Thank you. And what that does, two things. To me, first off, it takes you off of the railroad track of this is how it is, and it helps you to literally switch realities. But maybe even more than that is you get freedom from this because it takes you out of the victim mentality. Yes, that's beautifully put. And it takes you into a mentality that asks, what is essential? What is essential? What are the essential things I need to be doing? What is the essential company that I need to be in? One of the byproducts, and I think it's a wonderful byproduct, of arriving at 
your focus, your aim, that which you live for is, it also determines the company you keep. You may spend less time with people who don't aid and abet what you're after. I don't mean that in some sort of ruthless sense. It's just that it refines how you spend your day, how you go through your life, what kinds of relationships you have. Another of the things I write about in the book is that it's so critically important to have relationships that build you up. It doesn't mean everything is always easy and fun and fluffy. It could be very difficult, but if a relationship builds you up, then you will gravitate towards that as naturally as water runs downhill when you have a true focus. Thank you. So on that note, and I think I said it wrong. I know I said it wrong a couple of times. Where can people go to find Cosmic Habit Force and to find out more? Well, uh, Cosmic Habit Force is available now in hard copy, digital, audio. Uh, they can find it on Amazon or any place that buy their books. They can find me at my website, MitchHorowitz.com or on social media. And it's quite a year. Cosmic Habit Force just came out. Daydream Believer is coming out in the month of July. And I have a collection of essays called Uncertain Places, which is coming out in the month of October. I think you are motivating he, me here, Mitch. I create a tremendous amount of content, but I haven't put out a book since I got out all the automatic writing experience. And I know that this was not happenstance that we met today, that we're talking here today, and I am going to be pulling out my pen and dusting it off. I write on a daily basis, and I teach on a weekly basis, but I'm going to be diving back into a next book. It is time. Right on. Right on. So I look forward to reading it. Thank you. On that note, so do I. <laughs> I, must, I must say, so do I. A lot of what I do is is I get in this sacred space, as I'm sure you do, and, and what comes out is profound. And for myself, a lot of what comes out, there is me in it, and there is something else. And I'm like, wow, I'm learning as I'm writing. That is an incredibly important point. And William James, another one of my heroes, made the point that you learn as you speak and you write. Expressiveness is an act of pupilship. New things come out of you that wouldn't come out if you weren't writing and speaking. Okay, on that note, any last words of wisdom before I go get Rue for a meditation? Any last words of wisdom you want to share with ESP, with the world being ooh, squidgier than we thought it was and setting ourselves free in a sense? Well, what I would share is this. We've covered the ground of a lot of far out ideas in this show. We've talked about interdimensionality. We've talked about UFOs. We've talked about time slips. We've talked about precognition, ESP, retro causality. I mean, this is definitely a meta episode of Inspire Nation. Have you had fun? <laughs> <laughs> I have had fun, as a matter of fact. And what I would say to everybody listening is this. We are all experimenters. Everything that we've talked about today raises so many questions and the dimension of the psyche is such a mystery to us. And this generation and the generation to follow, I believe is on the threshold of some really extraordinary breakthrough ideas that are gonna change our conceptions of human nature. But the critical thing is, if you groove to the ideas that we've been talking about, regardless of how far out some of them sound, regardless of whether everybody's followed everything. If you groove to these ideas, then just fathom for a moment the untapped unknown dimensions and powers of your own psyche. And it stands to reason that however great the vistas that we're all standing in front of, we can all agree on this. The dimensions of the psyche are vaster and fuller and more mysterious than anything we've ever known. So think about that in terms of your own personal power. We're all beset by events that are difficult. We're all buffeted around by storms that are just part of life. But we have tools and possibilities in terms of our psyche that are greater than anything we've ever understood. So wherever all this is going, and we really won't know where all this is going, it falls to future generations to, to chart out some of this territory, but wherever it's going, we know that the dimensions of our psyche are just extraordinary and greater than anything we, we grew up with. So be heartened by that. Allow yourself to feel a sense of 
joy and possibility emanating from that and also a sense of responsibility. Thank you. And on that note, the words of William James that I was looking for, the mystic views things as if seeing them under a microscope. And that's the game we now get to play. Yeah, that, I'm so glad you found that quote. I, I referenced that quote in several books and it does so much to marry the reality that we experience in the above ground conventional world to the reality that's experienced in the particle lab or the reality that might be experienced within models of interdimensionality. The mystic, James said, sees things more clearly, sees all that's going on. Sometimes particle physicists today will use the term information leakage that when we're viewing things through the coarse measurements of our ordinary senses, we see less and less of what's really going on. So the real deal may be what's happening in the particle lab, may be what's happening in the ESP lab, may be what's happening in the, the theorized model of interdimensionality. That may be the real deal. That's the microscope. Woohoo! All right, let me go, Garbrew, and then we'll do a brief meditation. And thank you so, so much. Be right back. I want to say hi to Mitch. <laughs> Michael, I could say with certainty, you're the only man I know who has a spiral staircase and a oh. rooster in his home. <laughs> it's, it's unprecedented. <laughs> and and use the two of them together. Use and as use a string the two of them together. <laughs> so would you mind leading us? He's he's ready. He's already blissed out. Would you mind leading us in a meditation? Something, whatever you feel called to today. I ask all of us together to embark on a small but potentially seismic exercise. <laughs> Thank you, Rue. I appreciate the affirmation. <laughs> and I guess that's a wake-up call, so I'll take that as a cue. The small but seismic exercise is this, and even if you've done it before, let's, let's all do it again, and let's do it together. And that is take time today to ask yourself, deeply, seriously, maturely, and with a total lack of embarrassment or inhibition, what you really want in life. Don't hide from it. Don't feel that you need to condition it. Don't feel that you need to adjust it so that it sounds good or spiritual or serious or whatever, whatever these voices of peer pressure are in our heads that limit us and cordon us off. It's yours. It's yours. And Keep it private, keep it to yourself, but ask yourself, what do I really, really want in life? Be honest, be unembarrassed, and be prepared for that answer, that response, to be jarring, to be unexpected, to be surprising. And my wish for you is that it be surprising, and with that sense of freshness, with that sense of freshness, you may be setting into motion possibilities eminent from your psyche that you've never dreamed of. Let's all join in that together today. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Mitch. Pleasure. Thank you. This has Good been be so much fun, and, I, and I, I feel like this is a long reunion. It's been only, I think, eight months, but it feels like a long reunion, and I'm so glad we've caught up today. Likewise, likewise. I look forward to next time. It's always great being here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Roo Roo trumpets for you. So for everyone out here, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get cosmic habit force, and begin diving into the unknown and the power that you have today. And above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! What a brilliant, brilliant talk I just had with Mitch. We were beautiful all over the place from ESP to alternative realities to UFOs and bringing it home to you, the mystic that you are. On that note, if you want to become a mystic, as we were just talking about, come join us for our School of Mystics for Wednesdays every month as we help you to see into the unknown, to hear from the beyond, and to know without thought. That's at inspirenationuniversity.com. Of course, click the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows, YouTube premieres, live events with me every Monday night. Love you guys so, so much. Keep on shining. 
How does it get any better than this, Rue? How does it get any better than this? Remember, we are also a podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or anywhere that you listen to your podcast. Do be sure to check out all the automatic writing experience as well. Here's a link to our next amazing video. Love you guys so, so much. Keep on shining bright. How does it get any better than this, Rue?